called the chart house because the Navy doesn't use maps. The Navy uses charts. <laughs> There's three charts on display here. Over here is the Fusca, relevant to the Midway in as much as this ship was in port in Japan for 17 years. Over here is San Diego. That's on display because we're here. And over here is Subic Bay, the Philippines, very frequent port of call for the Midway, especially during the Vietnam era. This space is home to the navigator. He's also an aviator. He has to know what it's like to be a pilot. Um, and while this ship was in service, which was 1945 to 1992, he had four ways of navigating the ship, two in port, two at sea. If uh, we were leaving this port right now, we'd probably default to a system called piloting. That calls for putting lookouts on the drone portion of the ship and looking through devices. They sort of resemble small telescopes. You can shoot a bearing or a line of three known objects. A known object in the case of this port might be a hotel, a lighthouse, an air traffic control tower. Where those three lines come back and intersect, and you'll see some intersecting lines on this chart and that chart, that tells the navigator where the ship is at within about 100 feet. Extremely accurate. At night, or when visibility was obstructed, same type of system, only what you couldn't see with your eyes, you could see with the radar. Wasn't quite as accurate, but it was doable. When the ship was at sea, the most common method for determining the position of the ship was to utilize celestial navigation. It's been used since the late 1700s. You need a sextant, and there is a sextant in that case, and the diagram of the sextant over here. And of course, you need someone that knows how to use it. <laughs> a real, real short story, it's a very short story on celestial navigation. You've only got about 30 minutes at dawn and 30 minutes at dusk to use it because you need to be able to see the horizon and certain celestial bodies at the same time. So using that sextance and charts and calculations and a very accurate clock, you can pinpoint your position anywhere on the globe within about one to three miles. Now one to three miles doesn't do you a bit of good inside a small port like here, but out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, perfectly acceptable. Fourth method relates to that equipment down at the end of the counter. Uh, there are several forms of electronic navigation installed on the ship over the years, the most recent being the GPS. Uh, that's a very early GPS system. Um, it was, it, despite being very accurate, it wasn't very accurate because at that time, in the early 80s, there were very few GPS satellites or we need. So they didn't, they didn't go on that much. Now, another form of uh, navigation, which is called dead reckoning. It's actually pretty interesting. They use it with aircraft during World War II and in ships. Up on the bridge, there's a, a petty officer that is mentoring in a handwritten log every order that changed the speed and the direction of the ship. And then when that book gets filled up, it goes back to Washington, D.C. That's how when you read books on World War II, they know that all these ships went in different paths because they have all these log books. Well, if everything else fails, and if you know where you started out in the morning, and you know you went for a certain amount of time doing so many knots, turns, you can figure out roughly where you're at. But what it doesn't take into consideration is, is wind and tides. So that, you know, but it, it, it works. You know, it gives you a rough idea how to do it. Pretty interesting. All right, well, let's, let's head up to the bridge. Yeah. So, they would only know oh, yeah. exactly where they're yeah, working. All right, folks, welcome to the bridge. This is home to, among others, the commanding officer. That's his seat right there. Uh, if you weren't the commanding officer, don't go anywhere near it. <laughs> now, this seat ah. over here says Gator, belonged to the navigator. He might let you use that seat, but if he didn't give you express permission, don't go anywhere near it. 
commanding officer of an aircraft carrier, huge, huge responsibility. It goes far beyond just navigating the ship. So just like the navigator and the air boss, he's got lots of help up here. Across the front portion of the bridge, three other officers. The officer of the deck, junior officer of the deck, and junior officer of the watch. The officer of the deck will be entrusted most of the time with navigating the ship on behalf of the captain. The two junior officers, they have a myriad of responsibilities, not the least of which is education, because just like the mini boss, moving up the ladder. Now there is another officer called the conning officer, but the conning officer isn't the person. It's a responsibility. At any point in time, one and only one of those four officers will have the con, which means he's the only officer that can give orders back here to the pilot house with regard to the speed and the direction of the ship. Now with regard to the direction of the ship, it's handled here at the helm. This wheel back here controls the rudders. A helmsman, by the way, junior enlisted guy, 19 years old. You know, two years ago he was fighting for the keys to his family's car. But today, he's steering a 70,000 ton ship. And interesting, when you're back there at the helm, you can't see where you're going. You're relying on the orders that come from the conning officer to turn the ship so many degrees in what direction. That's all you got to know. So the guys that actually can see, they're not steering the ship. No, no, the the wow. the, uh, <laughs> they're telling him the officer of the yeah. deck is telling them how oh, far to turn. bearing you're going yeah. by the compass. Yeah. yeah. So um, now the speed of the ship is controlled by the Lee helmsman, and he's here with this device. It's called an engine order telegraph. There's one here and one in each of the four engine rooms. This half of this device takes care of the port side, two engines on the port side, two on the right side. Conning officer might order a head two thirds, so he'll roll two thirds, two thirds. That goes down to the engine room, and they'll acknowledge receipt of that portion of the order. And I say portion of the order because a head two thirds is a range of knots, three, four, sometimes five knots. And there's times you have to very precisely control the speed of the ship. You do that by controlling the revolutions per minute of the four propellers. Wow, the conning cool. officer might order 110 revolutions, one, one, zero, down to the engine rooms. Now the, in, now the order is complete. Now the appropriate amount of steam is either pushed into or let out of the turbines. Prime example of when the speed of the ship has to be exact. If you look at that photograph on the bulkhead, that ship in the middle is a supply ship. And actually, if you look 180 degrees that way, you'll see a modern version of a supply mm -hmm. ship right over there. No. That ship has got something that those ship, other ships want. Diesel fuel, jet fuel, ordnance, food, uh, parts. And the way that process works, it's the supply ship that's maintaining a very specific course and speed. And it's the obligation of the ships to be resupplied, pull up alongside, match that course and speed exactly, so they can run cables and fuel lines across. It's a very dangerous operation, so much so that the captain will leave his seat there, and he'll go over here in auxiliary con, and he'll keep an eye on the process uh, from over that way. Uh, sticking with the captain for a bit, ship is at sea, he very rarely leaves this space. He's got a big cabin you can go visit down below, but again, when the ship is at sea, and, he, and because he's responsible for anything that happens on the ship, he leaves very little to chance. Uh, he's got a little cabin, we'll see it when we go out, It'll be on the left hand side down there, that's his at sea cabin. When he goes in there to take a nap, he'll usually ask to be ordered, to be he'll order to be woken up about every hour, just to keep keep in Jeez. touch with everything. He, uh, he's probably in that, that chair 12 to 18 hours a day. Now if you want to go down to his cabin as well as the war room, and the Admiral's quarters. When you get done with this tour, when you walk back on the flight deck, turn left, second door, take your right down to see a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Let me take a look here to make sure nobody else is coming. Um, a carrier left a little while ago, the Abraham Lincoln was just over there. The big Navy base is down on the other side of the Coronado Bridge. But the aircraft carrier's berth here for a couple reasons. One, there's no space for them down at 32nd Street. But also, the harbor, which was initially dredged right before World War II, it's been dredged several times since, is not deep enough 
for the carriers to go past the Coronado Bridge so that they don't go any further uh, than right here. The submarine base, you won't see any submarines down this way, the submarine base is right at the entrance to the harbor, which hmm. actually is right over at the end of that, that, that right over that point. Um, people ask about the differences between the new and the old carriers. Well, first of all, there's 10 carriers in the service. They're all virtually the same. They're known as Nimitz class carriers. A lot of similarities, a lot of differences. Biggest similarity is steam. Both the new and the old use steam for uh, propulsion, generating electricity, launching aircraft, and cooking. But where they get the steam is the big difference. This ship got its steam from burning diesel fuel, burned it in 12 big boilers. The Nimitz class ships, they get their heat to create steam from nuclear reactors. Big advantage, nuclear versus conventional, has to do with refueling. Mm -hmm. In 47 years, the ship might have gotten refueled 15,000 times, most of the time at sea, which in addition to being more dangerous, you can't complete your mission because you can't launch and recover aircraft during that process. So 47 years, 15,000 refuelings, and the Nimitz-class ships, they have a lifespan of 50 years, and they get refueled just once mm -hmm. in 25 years. Really? Our newest class of carrier, the Ford class, the Gerald Ford is completed, it's been commissioned, but it isn't uh, in service yet, maybe later on, earlier next year. There'll be three of those, the Gerald Ford, the JFK, and the Doris Miller. Uh, they're, des they're designed to go 50 years with no refueling hmm. whatsoever. That's, that's amazing, 50 years no wow. refueling. I so I have to ask who's Doris Miller. I Doris do Miller was the black seaman at Pearl Harbor, he was a, uh, uh, what's the word the Navy uses? Uh, uh, he would serve the food. What's the, what's the term? I was in the Marines, not the Navy. I can't remember. It was, it was not a cook, obviously. Then. No, he was a, uh, a steward. <laughs> steward. Okay. steward. He was yeah. a steward. Yeah. And when the attack on, he was on, I think he was, I think he, I don't know if he was on the Arizona. Or, I think he was. I think he was. And uh, he came from down below and uh, to help defend the ship. And I think he's actually credited to shooting down a couple planes. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. that's what it's yeah. Yeah. He, he was really? also he got the uh, uh, he got Medal, of Medal of Honor. Yeah. Medal of Honor. Yeah. Yeah. Doris Miller was his name. Wow, yeah. that's a pretty heavy honor. It's oh, in that movie. Yeah. Um, was it the second Pearl Harbor or the first second. Pearl Harbor movie? Oh, no, like one of the Pearl Harbor yeah, one movies of where he Tora, was Tora, Tora, Tora. Cuba. I mean, Cuba Junior. Gooding. Cuba. Gooding. Gooding Junior. Yeah, he plays him in that movie. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite an honor. It's quite an honor. Um, I know it's coming here, so a couple extra minutes. This ship uh, took a year and a half to build at a cost in 1945 dollars of 86 million dollars. Put that in an inflation calculator, and it's a little over a billion. The Gerald Ford you were just talking about took nine years to build for a cost of between 12 and 13 billion dollars. Yeah. Ten times the amount of time. Ten times the amount of money, but they were building a lot of ships back yeah, in mid 19, 1945. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Something interesting about industrial production: Japanese lost four aircraft carriers at the Battle of Midway, which was devastating because they didn't have the industrial production to replace them. During World War II, the Japanese put from the start of World War II to the end, they put 13 aircraft carriers in service. During that same period of time, the United States built over 140. When World War II ended in the Pacific, the United States had 71 aircraft carriers in the Pacific. Although not all of them were these big, fast carriers, a lot of them were what they called jeep carriers. They were built on uh, freighter hulls. They were uh, about two-thirds the length, uh, it, it much, much slower, maybe about 10, 12 knots versus 32 knots and most of their service was in protecting the convoys. But uh, a lot of aircraft carriers. So with that, thank you very much for coming on board. We appreciate it. We thank you. We go thank out you here to much. the left. Keep looking down this hallway to your left. You'll see the captain's at sea cabin. And then tomorrow, I think I mentioned tomorrow, it starts Fleet Week in San Diego. There'll be some Navy ships and equipment over here to visit. I think the ships will open up about 1 o'clock or 1.30. But if you're coming down here, if you're driving, Park on the pier, stay away from the meters, and if you want to take public transportation or Uber, that might even be a better shot. But there'll be a lot to do hmm. down here over the whole weekend. So what time, like, how late do we go at night? I couldn't tell you, but probably about six. But I think if you just search 
uh, Fleet Week San Diego. Will be there. But there'll be a lot of things going on there. A lot of ships to go on. All right, folks, thank you very much. Thank, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you very much. I don't make floors like this anymore. Amazing. You can go down frontwards or backwards, whatever is easier for you. Either way, watch your head. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's pretty good. Oh, wow, fancy dog. See, this is his room. Oh. The captain's <laughs> quarters. Yeah. Nice. Wow, look at this. Look at that radio. Do you see that old radio? Right, right here, the radio, old radio, wooden radio. Oh yeah, I love that. This is a captain? Yep. I love the switch, you see the switch? Oh yeah, yeah. That's actually pretty modern for, but I'm sure it's been retrofitted. Chief of Staff State Room. Oh, look at the TV. Chief of Staff, Admiral Commanding. Look at that. TV. So this must be maybe the maybe this is Admiral's quarters. Oh yeah, that old TV. Hmm. Oh, look at that. It went on the Lee Golden Gate Bridge. Uh huh. It took only a year and a half to build. Amazing. Well, that's back when we had industrial might. Oh, they have their old kitchen too. Oh yeah. Wow. So they got their own. Yeah. Damn, it's good to be a captain, I guess, huh? Rank, huh? rank has its privileges. Yeah. Space. Brian, those are typewriters. My mom had a typewriter just like that. Oh, 91. Greetings and welcome aboard. My name is Rear Admiral Dan March. I'm retired from the Navy. The admirals are coming together. Oh, the Navy. Uh, other way we finish now. Extra training exercise, whatever. Oh. Well, I know, you go this way here, and they'll take you to the radio room, and then the captain's and port captain. They'll bring you back up to the flight deck. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah, welcome Hello, to the Command Center. Everything's oh. set up the way it looked in Desert Storm. It's the last wow. combat this ship saw. Wow. These happen to be recordings. They show the midway in the Persian oh, okay. Gulf on January 17th, 1991, just as the war started. Symbology is defined up here. Circles are friendly. Diamonds are enemy. Squares are neutral non-combatants. Okay. Yeah. Upper half symbols an aircraft. Full symbols a ship. Lower half symbols a submarine. So with these nine symbols, we track everything that moves yeah. out there. Yeah. And we're getting a lot of information because we're all networked together. It's called the Link 11 Tactical Data Link. Somebody sees something out here, they send it to us. If we see something, we send it to them. So we're yeah. all exchanging Everything information. All and effectively broads our horizons right. what we're able to see and track. So we're all working together, network together as a team. Now they send it to us, it goes to the main computer. We have dozens of these computers located all around the ship. They're all hardwired into the main computer. And so you get uh, virtually real-time status of everything that's going on out there. Oh, it's amazing. In modern warfare, it's not the side with most guns and bombs that's going to win. It's the side with the best situational awareness that's going to yep. win. Yep. And situational awareness is what we're all about here. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Take situation awareness to another level. The admiral brought this television set to see his own money so he can watch yeah. CNN. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. These guys had the latest technology to broadcast it live from downtown Baghdad. At the same time, we're bombing downtown Baghdad. Right. So, by watching CNN, we can see we're hitting the targets here. As of 7 o'clock p.m., Operation Desert Storm Forces are engaging targets to Kuwait and Iraq. Wow, that's one of the cruise missiles right there. Yeah. So mm -hmm. not on target. 
but off all their power and until the wind came. And I think John, that airbird took out the telecommunications. Yeah. Now you may see the bombs now. If you're still with us, you can hear the bombs now. They are hitting the center of the city. Just one comment. Clearly, I've never been there, but awesome. it feels like yep. we're in the center of hell. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so welcome. Yeah. Oh, that makes yeah, you a that. little bit twitchy, right? Yeah. Woohoo, what's going on? What's coming our way? Yeah. <laughs> you never know. Right. You never know. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, you're welcome. Oh, amazing. Oh, fancy. Amazing ship. Did you see this? If they need to send a note, they call them bunny tubes, pneumatic message tubes. They can write a handwritten message and send it to different places in the ship. Wow. Yeah, look at this technology. This was doing the back deck. Too. Yeah, Desert Storm 91. Wow. So 91 was the last. You know, she got retired after that. Oh yeah, the oscilloscopes and all the old electronic equipment. They yeah. keep this thing really clean in here too. It's amazing. Keep the history done. Mm-hmm. Transmitters. And these rooms, these rooms, they keep them really cold. Look at this. Oh, really? Keep them cold? Why? Because it's electronic. Anything with electronics, you got to keep cold. Oh, it'll work. I'm sure it's, they can still power these up and it's still going. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It's all, it's all here. Receiver. Oh my god. What are these? Switchboard. Switchboards. Different channels, I guess. Wow. Telephone, it might be telephone line, not sure. It said right here, this panel connect to incoming audio signal to various communication equipment. Yeah, audio signals. Wow. A lot of knobs to turn. Let me uh, change my battery out since we're it's getting close. I think captain is higher than commander. Yes. Oh, look at that, Japanese style. Look at that. 
stops right here with me. At the end of the day, I'm responsible to the Admiral and ultimately our Commander-in-Chief for everything that takes place on this ship, under some of the most challenging conditions you can imagine. It's a job that allows precious little sleep. In fact, sometimes I catch a few winks up in the island when we're at sea. Being captain really comes down to motivating each of my sailors to do their jobs to the very best of their abilities. From engineering to communications, I have to mold thousands of individuals in the middle of the ocean into a single functioning team. I have to inspire them every day to rise above personal issues, like being away from their families for months at a time. If just one midway sailor fails, we all fail. I can guarantee you that can turn a few hairs gray. This is the officer of the deck. The boilers are back online and flight ops is a go. Thanks, Art. I'll be right up. Being captain of the USS Midway is a brutal job, but it's also the best job of my career because the stakes are as high as the rewards. Imagine commanding an aircraft carrier and being solely responsible for the safety of so many sailors in one of the most dangerous environments you can find anywhere. It's a humbling responsibility, one that I'll value for the rest of my life. Well, I'll have to finish my paperwork here. Flight ops are about to start. I hope you'll think about the extraordinary dedication of my crew as you continue your tour. They make Midway magic every day. Thanks for coming aboard. <laughs> oh, microwave. My mom had one just very yeah. similar to that. Yeah. Look at the rice cooker. Minute rice. Look at that. Campbell yeah. soup. Oh, yeah. Flabber gurgle, garlic salt, Morton. Yeah, loop loop around, walk on this other side. There's a beautiful view. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's So the other stuff's open. It's not open yet. It's open tomorrow. What is? Completely. The displays. Look at this now. 
kann man die anderen nieder haben. Must be this the uh, steam catapult part. Steam catapult, steam power, steam power catapult to pull the planes to speed, or or the or it's the or the resting wire. These things are amazing. Oh, here's the lights. You know, it's like a vast, it's like a vast kind of. Mm. You know, you, the higher you are, the elevation and stuff. But it's more precise.
this is cool. Yeah. Yeah, look at these seats. I know, I wish we had these chairs. Oh, I remember that song. They always played that song. Wow. These chairs are amazing. Oh, wow, this is chair, too. Wow. Nice. I can't read it. CD and DVD player. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah, I have one here. Oh, yeah, DVD player. And CD player. Suppression stuff, looks like. 
Oh no, that's probably re that's refueling hoses, I think, to refuel. Oh yeah. I think. Pretty amazing. Oh great, I'm glad you're enjoying it. Oh yeah, this is awesome. Thank you. Wave off the aircraft about three seconds before it drops. Is this a second out, maybe you go ahead. But it can get really tight because usually there's going to be maybe 10 seconds of clear deck. I guess you have to be taller than me. Ruby leaving with us. Southwest Airlines too. That's cool. Kaiser. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Did you have a good time? Yes. Excellent. Bye. Thank you very much.
that was an amazing yeah, experience. Amazing. Definitely would do that again. America living symbol of freedom.